So tonight we have, um, it's the last talk of, of the summer. Uh, yes? Yeah? You want to come back? Yes, okay. It's free to, to, to come, but next year. Yes? So um, tonight we have a, a talk with David Berlo. Um, and I will introduce David. I have to say a few things about him. I learned some stuff recently. He told, he told us about his, his, his life on the other day when we were at the restaurant. He told me j right after to don't say a word to present him as someone else, but I have to tell you what he told me the other day. Um, so David, maybe something I'm, I don't recall completely perfectly, and he will correct me after, but uh, David, um, was always interested in letter form since his young age. Uh, he's a son of an artist, of a doctor. Um, on, but the first time he encounter, uh, encounter with fi fine arts on typography, started, it was in the Rocky Mountain. He was there to, 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 sky, to ski on, on the snow, and he met a professor who suggested him to study art at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Berlo at this time still did not ever know it was possible to be a typeface designer rather than just a user of typeface. <coughs> and then after his study, um, he decided to, to move to New York and uh, to search for jobs. So the first job was in advertising agency, but after two months he realized that it's not something for him. So you have to find another, another um, position. And um, so you have sent a few letters, and suddenly you receive a call from Linotype and say, he wasn't there actually, but someone with him, probably his father, or say, yes, uh, David will receive a call from uh, Linotype. You have to call, call them back. And um, so he was accepted on this company. So he, he entered into in type industry in 78. Um, as a letter designer at Mergenthaler. But in, in, in this place, it was the youngest uh, of the company. And um, so the first computer began to, to arrive on these companies. And uh, David was, was the most capable to use this kind of computer. More, no more <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. It's back. Cool. <laughs> so um, at this moment, the first computer began to arrive on, on the beginning to digitize with Icarus system. And uh, he wanted always to do, to do much more than the Icarus limitation on such very big machine at the time. So he tried to do so much things that Icarus were, were not happy with that. So at some time, at some point, you have to, to leave Linotype to find a new, uh, a new activity to continue to produce typeface on the computer. So he joined um, a new company called Bistream in the early 90s, 80s. And, um, and then he continued to, to work on the digitization process and to make the thing happening on the screen. Uh, and also to think about interface design. So when you have interface, to be able to play with the curve, to play with the shape. Because at the time, before with Icarus, it's just, you have to draw on paper and to scan it again or to digitize it again, but no way to interact with the basic curve or the spline or the curve at the time in, in such machines. So he tried al always to go more far than the, the, the computer or the software be able to, to provide to the team at the time. So even when he was at Bitstream, one day he said, Okay, I have, a, I, have a, I have a good idea. Uh, could you add to the software copy past? Copy past, yes. <laughs> Before on the computer, no way to copy past any shape. And he said, uh, so the boss of the, of the company said, yeah, a copy past, but how, how many hours you can save by week to, to be able to, if we activate that, he said, six hours. I said, yes, so it was implemented in the software. So, you know, David, it's always pushing the thing more, more far than the, than the limit of the, of the software of the, of, the, of the company. So, yes, my face idea, okay. And then, um, at some point at this stream, some limitation appear because the invention of the Macintosh, uh, mid 80s, and, and very, very, very soon after, a photographer was there. So, no need 
this big machine to produce a typeface anymore. With a simple tool on a simple computer, you can produce your typeface. So David was there and said, okay, we will have to move away and I have just to design typeface with photographer on, the, on, the, on his computer. So he, he, he launched a new company was with um, uh, uh, Roger Black. The name of the company was at the time Font Bureau. And for Font Bureau, uh, Font Bureau was suddenly one of the major players in, in the US because they worked for a lot of software companies, a lot of newspapers uh, everywhere in, in, in the country. Also, I can say that um, I'm sure in this room, every of you at some point in your career already used some of the David Berlow typeface that it touched in the operating system that you use, the newspapers that you read. At some point, you, you have some of this his typeface in, in the front of you to read some text. Also, I can say that David is the, one of the most influential type designer in the US because without him, a lot of young type designers never, uh, probably never been into this business. So I will, I will say, I will quote the name of three designers, Tobias Frere Jones, Christian Schwartz, Cyrus si Smith, but there is many others who are in, in, under his influence to, to be a major type designer today. Um, so more recently, he decided to go to, to even to go to another world with type network. So he decided to, to restrain from, from Bureau and to find a new way to distribute fonts and to, to, to also to make every type designer respected as a, as a foundry. So it's all the type designer at Font Bureau now, they have their own foundries and, and they are separate and they are a proper item uh, entity, but they are part of a larger group in an in independent studio called Type, type Networks who help to publish and to distribute the typeface. So you can see that all the time, David, it's always at the fringe of the new things for the future. So welcome, David. I'm very happy to have you, my friend, so please. One of the things I didn't tell him that I'll tell you is that when I was a small child, I dreamed that I would grow up and come to Paris and give a presentation to a bunch of half-drunk people. <laughs> <laughs> so this is truly a dream come true. This is what I think when I accept a speaking engagement. It's like Paris, panic, and then summer is afterwards, so I'm gonna be okay. But uh, I can't see my presentation notes, so I don't know what to do. It's 9.13 and 21 seconds, 23. No, we can, we can, we can do that. Uh, it's not this thing. No, this is the shortcuts. Uh, how to exit that? And then, Merci beaucoup. <laughs> okay. So, the first thing is to say thank you. I, I shouldn't f forget that. Um, coming up with a uh, topic for a, a uh, conference like this was not difficult for me because I've spent most of the last three two years working on variable fonts. And I think that uh, that's probably the best thing to talk about at this point. Um, some of the littlest things that interest me are common to many type designers. The exact location of a point where an almost straight line changes, 
or the broad sweeping curves that give shapes the exact kind of roundness. And other elements too small for most people to notice, much less to name. But now we have a sea change in type technology, variable fonts, where huge quantities of typographic potential can easily be stored and transmitted in a single file from one computer to another. And with a few lines of CSS, such a file can turn a computer screen into a reasonable facsimile of, among other things, our typographic pasts. Such fonts used openly in a worldwide environment can also have a great impact on the typography of the present as well as forming entirely new kinds of type. The most elemental piece of my thinking are, are the roots of typography. And primarily, I'm talking about workhorse typefaces that you would use for you could use for a lot of purposes, um, as opposed to the beautiful and interesting display faces that people make out of various things, uh, including digital ones. But you know, as you saw from the last presentation, graphic designers have a way of seeing type in just about anything you can imagine. And I've never thought of lettuce as containing type. Uh, it fuels me. I eat a lot of lettuce, and then I make type. Uh, but I'm, I'm interested to see when graphic designers take a shortcut and they just use the lettuce and make fonts. So that's, that's something that uh, many graphic designers think that type designers think that they're crazy, but it's, it's part of the environment of typography, and it's important for everybody to understand uh, what I'm talking about is workhorse types. Uh, and these just have a few kind of elements that create all the designs and all the scripts in the world. These elements come in two colors. One color is opaque or black or something, and the other is white and transparent or nothing. Uh, it depends on how you're talking about it and also how you're thinking about it. And I think of type as not being black on white. I think of it as being an, uh, uh, an opacity uh, that you give to somebody to do with as they please. Um, in fact, uh, most people who draw typefaces don't realize that the line that they draw is, is transparent. Um, you see it on the screen while you're drawing and you think of the letter as being starting with that black line, but it doesn't actually start there. The, it's, a tr it's, a, it's a transparent line that you create that encloses the black or thing or uh, opacity. And this is important to me because it's exactly the same as punch cutting. Uh, when somebody cut a metal punch, they started with a square piece of metal on the on the front, and they never touched what was going to be black. They only touched the white part and got rid of it all, created nothing, so that when they struck the letter in, it created the thing that they needed. So, uh, and I tell this story in a, on, on a, in a, in a uh, um, an article I wrote a year or two ago, uh, and it's important because at one point, Adobe tried to change that and say that the line was part of it because it made it a lot easier to render if the line that you took could be just drawn as a bunch of pixels. Uh, but that made all the letters in the world that had already been digitized look like they had been dipped in chocolate. So as much as I liked that idea, um, <laughs> it, it didn't really work that way. So Adobe had to change their rendering completely at the last minute for the release of PostScript because people like Linotype and uh, Donald Knuth and other people disagreed with what they were doing. And it would have meant that everybody would have to re-digitize everything that was already digitized. Um, so both elements, both colors come in three flavors. Um, something 
or nothing comes in each color and the beginnings and, and ends of each thing exist and the connections of each thing to itself <coughs> exist. And uh, I should be clear that there are gray areas before I show you how I make these divisions. Uh, every typeface has a different way of showing you where these things are and it's not like here's where the thing ends and here's where the connection starts. Uh, it's, it's more of just a mental exercise. So this is what the things are. They are the stems, uh, the bars, the arms, the legs are about half of what type designers think about. Uh, those are the things and if you show everything else you can still see sort of what it is but not exactly. And then these are the connections of things that, that bring them together and seen and removed these bridge the differences between the things as they connect and are the expansion and contraction joints for the changes that you do to uh, the letters. And then there are the beginnings and ends of things and the balls, the feet, uh, serifs, tails, terminals, whether they have any flavor or not, uh, they affect greatly what we see. Um, so um, when people say serif, you think right away about a kind of typeface. And when you say sans serif, people imagine something without you ever showing them anything. And if I remove these, as you see on the right, it hardly has much of an effect on the letters. Now, Sumner Stone taught me about the first three things. We were driving down a road fighting about whether or not you should be allowed to design type on a screen, which everybody takes for granted now, but Adobe once said you had to draw everything by hand and then you digitized it. And when I started doing this this other way, there was great consternation and, and arguments and people screaming at me, actually saying, fuck you, uh, uh, here in France. 15 years ago, I said, you should be able to do this in Sumner. Fuck you! Which is not like Sumner. So he was really upset. Uh, and then it took me about 15 years to figure out that the nothings were a parallel to the somethings. But because Sumner had learned these three things while being taught calligraphy, calligraphers really, are, they just have the background there and they draw on it and they they, they think about that background and where they're putting the letters, but I decided that it go, the, the three things have three nothings that are sort of the yin and the yang of this. So uh, the, the, the nothings, uh, the, the, the chief of nothing is the nothing that's enclosed in a typeface, in a, in a letter. Uh, each one of those things are, we call them counters. In, in, in some some places, and the the counters are are like very very important that you can see uh, from the counters what the shapes are, and if you remove them, you can still see something except that the H has turned into the uh, end of text character instead. So it's it's a, a problem there. Um, connections to nothing are the least important uh, uh, to show, but they're the most important in distinguishing letters. If I just show them on the left, you have no idea what's going on. If I take them away and I set that text, you would be confused trying to read that letter. So some people call these apertures, um, but really they're connecting two pieces of nothing to each other and the letter is constricting that uh, or not. Um, so a lot of modern typefaces have a C like this and then older ones have a C like this and this is more information and this is easier to render and so a lot of typefaces have become this so that they're easy for the computer um, and uh, so uh, the beginning and end of nothing is we have a, a unit that starts where the set width of the glyph is and that's the beginning of nothing and it flows around the character to the end of nothing and uh, if you take that away as you see uh, on the left here you can still read it uh, it's actually a design style in many places 
Um, but you wouldn't want to read text, for example. So for, so for uh, lots of purposes, you can do that, but for other purposes, you can't. And so these things are common to all scripts and all designs of all scripts that aren't ornamented completely. And if they're ornamented or made out of some organic material or something, they just gain sort of a quality to the edge of them that adds something else to them. So here is looking at uh, three uh, uh, characters from uh, Japanese, and you can see that these are all in the same alphabet, but they have a vastly different complexity to the glyphs. Uh, and we have a certain amount of this in Latin as well. Um, and you, but you can see that the more complex the, the Chinese glyph gets, the less uh, the beginnings and ends of things make sense, uh, as opposed to the characters on the other side, where a, a Japanese person could see those beginnings and endings and fill in the middle. And here are the uh, connections of nothings, uh, comparing these, the first two Chinese characters have no uh, apertures whatsoever, they're wide open spaces, and then the next one has 12 apertures in one glyph, and then be below you see the Latin alphabet that has a total of four, in this design. So as you can imagine, with an 8,000 character Chinese set, there are maybe 60 or 70,000 apertures in it. And so you see that the, the balance in each script is different of how the elements are used and how they work together. And um, the, the system is complete for me because when I remove all these things, there's uh, everything is accounted for, and there's nothing left, and there's not even nothing left. There's nothing. There's less than nothing. There's a void of, of, of in the letter forms, and uh, if there's anything left over, then I know I'm dealing with some sort of a special case of something. Um, and then these elements are classifiable by at least these four things, and there are some people that have a lot more, but I'm just going to talk about these. What is the general shape of something, whether it's round or uh, the, the element is in a, is, is, has round parts, or it's a, a square part, or it's triangular, or it's a combination. And then there's the orientation of the dimension that stylistically changes them. So you have a, a rectangle for an uppercase I, and uh, we measure across the I this way to see how thick it is relative to other letters, and then this way the, the letter adjusts at different sizes. Um, so uh, there's always one dimension that is, has one kind of important and an importance, and in the other dimension it's another kind of importance. And then there's the location of the element within a glyph, uh, whether it's the left side of the glyph or the right side of the glyph, the top or the bottom or the middle, uh, is important to what, how the element is going to work with that letter um, and, and the other letters. And then, of course, what glyph it is in and what glyph group that glyph is in and how many scripts there are in the font has a great effect on how you plan the design and the, the measuring of the elements. And the measuring takes us to the parametric issues uh, of type. And the parametric variety in a typeface, you can almost imagine from looking at the parameters, if you're as old as I am, what the typeface will look like. Um, so these are absolute measures relative to the M square that the type is designed on. Um, uh, and they are relative measures to other elements. So I, I, I design things, and I make sure that they work optically, and then I measure them afterwards. Uh, uh, in some cases, and sometimes I just set up a very rigid grid, and that grid is where the letters have to go. It depends on what kind of a letter you're trying to draw, but you can see in this first slide that if the elements are all of a single kind, like all the things have a very similar uh, parametric value, you can see that all the stems here are 68. Uh, or so, and that all the, the nothing in the middle 
is very close to being the same size and all the beginnings and ends, the side bearings are all very close to each other. And if you showed me a chart of this typeface, I would say, this is a modular font. I wouldn't have to look at it. So, or if the style has a lot of things that are close to it, like most sans serifs, all of the, all of the things are about the same measure. Um, whether they're vertical or horizontal, they have very little relative difference to each other. Uh, but on the other hand, the nothings have a great, the same kind of variety as they do in a serif face, or because of the geometry, or because of the style of writing that the characters are trying to show you, there is, you know, the things all are clustered here, and the nothings are spread out in value over a wide variety of uh, shapes. And the beginnings and ends of round things are, are, are different here than they were in the previous typeface because there's a square typeface doesn't capture so much nothing as opposed to an, uh, a round face does. And then finally, you have uh, other styles where the proper design has a wobbly edge and great parametric variety. It's a little hard to see here, but the left and right stems of the O have significant difference, and the left and right stems of the H have a significant difference. And that stem of the S going across is one of the largest stems in the alphabet. And this is based on uh, the, uh, the Kish typeface, and it was developed for the Los Angeles Times. And uh, it was a very difficult project because just as we finished making this very, very wobbly, uh, extremely uh, old style looking typeface, uh, they wanted a web version and there was just no way that uh, the memory uh, at the time could handle a typeface like this. So I had to sort of filter out of this design what was uh, necessary to keep in it for for the web, and they're using it uh, still to this day, which kind of makes me happy. Um, so to me, uh, the parametric uh, aspects of a typeface in a, in a workhorse typeface family that's going to be fairly large, it, you're trying to make all these shapes and parameters uh, match to form a series of styles that will work together. And then uh, there's great complexity when you have to mix these elements uh, to work in, in multiple scripts. Um, and, but mixing the elements in the styles of two or three different typefaces to, together is really the goal of most design documents. Um, we've been sort of pushed into this corner by technology over the last 25 years where uh, there are a lot of companies who just use a sans serif typeface. And unfortunately, four of these companies are Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Adobe. And <laughs> that's the alliance that's trying to bring variable fonts to uh, the world. So uh, they have a very, very narrow scope of view of what typography is based on their own personal choices, which are basically these uh, rather characterless uh, sans serif faces. And that is not the real tragedy of Helvetica. The real tragedy of Helvetica is this kind of design is being almost forced on all the scripts of the world to make a consistent set of user interface fonts for the world. And not all typeface, uh, not all scripts in the world really lend themselves to being Helvetica. So when people sort of complain about Helvetica, I keep my mouth shut uh, because they don't even know what the biggest problem is yet. Um, but I don't love Helvetica. I work for the company who made it, and I appreciate what it does. It provides a background for all the other things that people say. And when they say that Helvetica is boring, a lot of people say Helvetica is boring, but then they make this very exciting design. And when they turn the, 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 the identity over to text, they go to a, a sans serif face anyways. 
because that provides a good background for whatever they're doing. So as much as you might hate sans serifs or despise Helvetica, without them you don't have a background to argue against. So um, I love it because you know the sans serif gives this background for people to argue against, if nothing else. So here I show a, a kind of a worksheet that I, I use after I've designed the typeface. Uh, uh, some of the parameters have to be uh, uh, recorded. While I'm working on the typeface, some of the parameters have to be there, mostly to do with alignments. Uh, and everybody uses guidelines, or just about everybody, uh, for a typeface they're working on. But just because the cap height is some number, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the letters are that high. Uh, in the modular typeface, I showed you they are. But in just about every other typeface, those are just guidelines. And, and optically, everything gets, gets put together uh, as it needs to be seen. Um, but in the end, if you're doing hinting or if you're making a larger typeface family, you want to have the parametric values. Uh, uh, you want a, a chart like this so that you know what you're doing as far as um, uh, uh, relating the, the parts of the typeface families together. So um, when in, in the end, we really only give the user a few parameters to work with. They have a point size and uh, they have a bunch of weights to choose from by numbers. Um, but underlying that is this deep hierarchy of values in the typeface that the, the designer either makes by doing it with their eyes or some combination of measuring and, and doing things. Um, uh, so variable type is some sort of control over these root er elements uh, in a parametrically based system of changes. Uh, and uh, that's been going on for centuries. Uh, for optical sizes, people have been doing this. For different weights, people have been doing this. For different widths, people have been doing this. And you used to be able to, in the days of metal type, order a font that was, had different widths. Uh, so, because there was no tracking and it was very expensive to put little pieces of metal in between each letter if somebody had uh, uh, two different uses of the typeface they might have two different fonts with the same glyphs but different amounts of metal on either side and the same thing would happen vertically uh, you could set type 12 on 12 uh, but if you wanted to set it 12 on 14, then you had to put all these little pieces of metal in between the lines, and sometimes that was just too expensive for newspapers or magazines, so they would order the type with the letting built in. Um, so that's a parametric change to the, the beginnings and ends of nothing that's been around for centuries. Um, and in fact, when punch cutters work, they don't say how wide the character is going to be. You just you cut the letter, and then the person who punches it in has fit it onto a, a, a piece of metal, a brass usually, to make the mold, to make the letters. Um, so those are two different operations in the old days uh, where the punch cutter might suggest the width of it, but in the end, if it was going to work with the machine, the punch cutter didn't really have any control over how wide the characters. So, um, but up until recently, the dominant font format, which is open type, has not been very friendly to storing very much detail about the parametrics. Or uh, actually, I should say, I call this panometric type because variable fonts offer all of the parameters that you can have. Uh, whatever axes the designer builds in, uh, it's a solid interpolation between the, the variable font on one end of the spectrum and the variable font on the other end. So it's a, it's a panometric uh, 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 buffet for the uh, user to take advantage of. Um, but OpenType has not been very friendly about uh, expressing this information to the user. 
uh, for the most part, it's been, we've been trying to capture this information in the names, and uh, that can drive users nuts. If I gave somebody a family of 300 styles with these names in them, I wouldn't dare, but I'd be tempted to do such a thing to prove a point that uh, this is not the place that the, the user should be looking for the information about the type. The place that they should be looking about at the uh, information about the type is, is a different kind of an interface that's, that's uh, where they, uh, they have much fewer choices and much more power over what's going on. So uh, here's a more uh, modern chart where I have sort of wandered through this forest uh, where the trees have these leaves that break the typeface into colors that no one knows the names of. And so I've had to sort of, I, I abandoned the body parts that people use for, you know, arms and legs and heads and feet and, and uh, things and just went to uh, four letters because that's what the format needs. But uh, for example, there's X, which is going this way, opaque, and X, transparent. And so slowly, my foundry and my distributor are starting to speak in this language of these four-letter Ackermans because it's much more clear once everybody knows this language, you, you say that to somebody and they know exactly what you're talking about. And um, so now my clients are using this language too. Um, and uh, it, it makes it easier for us developing, but I certainly do not want to show these to users ever. Okay, so don't get the idea that you have to learn any of this stuff. So uh, variations are important because uh, it breaks down the barriers between the styles of a family. So you had regular and bold, and those were the designer's preferences. The type designer made those choices. And are they right for everybody? Are they right for everything? It used to be, yeah, but reality is that we got a lot of calls for customizations, which says that there's, you, you've got to have a little bit more flexibility in your foundry if you're going to make a customer happy with their very specific production process, for example. Um, so uh, it's good that it's breaking down that barriers, but on the other hand, it makes it impossible to name all the styles in a typeface family. Um, I have worked in this industry for uh, many, many, many years, and I've only come up for 12, with 12 names for different widths. But what happens when you're giving somebody 1,000 widths? I mean, how do you name those? Um, so that's one issue. Um, and if you're giving somebody uh, something with uh, six axes, six variable axes, and they each have a thousand possibilities, you do the math, you try to name it. I don't know how to do it except just hide all that stuff from the user and let them decide what to call the styles. So on, on one hand, you have the barriers broken down. On the other hand, it's hard to name everything that resists. On one hand, bringing the possibility of unlimited numeric variation of the root elements, and on the other hand, having no standard names for the most of them. On one hand, making font development much more complex, while on the other hand, offering the potential for much more sophisticated use with less uh, um, trouble in composition. Um, so, I call this panometric type because it offers all the values of whatever parameters it includes for the cre uh, from the creator to the user. Here I show one of the plan drawings. These are the kinds of drawings that I was making before we had any tools for this round of variations. And I should say that I experienced the first round of variations in 1992, and that sort of has proven now to have been a time machine to take me forward to 2015 to show me really what was going to be like uh, now. And then I started working back then towards this day because it was inevitable uh, for a number of reasons. So this is one of the 
plan drawings, and it used to have a caption underneath that said, this is uh, an illustration that's too complicated for you to understand. Don't let it bother you. Um, but I made it for uh, Santiago Orozco, who was uh, my, uh, who at the time was my intern, and now he's founded his own foundry in Monterey, Mexico. And um, what it shows is what I had been thinking I would do to make grades. Uh, and uh, grades are very slight variations of the weight of a typeface without changing the width. And uh, the first time we ever got a call for these was uh, from Playboy magazine. And Playboy magazine in the early 90s was switching over to Postscript. But they weren't changing their printing process. So they had a gravure uh, press for all of the pages that had skin and an offset press for the pages that had type. And all we were reading was the type, of course. But the two fonts had to match. Um, and so we went through this process of making these two weights of Baskerville uh, that went on for about four months. And we kept on making the grade higher and li lighter and heavier and lighter. And then uh, finally, I got an apology uh, from the manager of the production department that the first one that we had given them was right. And there was a little note attached. This is back when people sent packages to each other in the mail. And uh, I had two copies of the magazine and a little note on it saying, my deepest apologies, I needed my eyes examined, hef. So the publisher had basically lost, was losing his vision at the time and driving me nuts. But we then applied that to uh, the problem of newspaper typefaces. Mike Parker, who was at Linotype, had come to join me at Font Bureau and uh, to teach Tobias Fur Jones about text faces. And so he started working on something called the Pointer Project, uh, the Pointer Study for uh, the Pointer Center for Media Studies in St. Petersburg, Florida, gathered a bunch of newspaper designers together. Uh, to discuss the issues of high-speed presses, cheaper inks, cheaper papers, and how that was going to affect things. And uh, the, uh, the, the effects of that study is that we decided that we would make grades of the Pointer series, uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, and then the, the, we would supply the whole thing as a package, and the, 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 uh, the newspaper would choose which ones they wanted, and that's, those were the grades that they would get. And, um, this was a little bit different from the grades that are made today uh, with variable fonts because that was the grades of a weight. So you had the regular weight and then it had four grades. And this illustration is an attempt to grasp what happens when you try to make the grades of an entire range of weights of a typeface. And what I learned from this experiment that we had thought about, me and Tom Rickner, who worked at Apple at the time, and we were working on the variations technology together and trying to figure out other things that you could do with it. And I knew about grades. And so I, I tried to uh, figure out how I would make grades. And it basically came down to taking uh, the regular weight and the bold weight and then putting the bold weight on the regular widths and the, the light weight on the bolder widths. And then if you interpolated in a square, you got all of the grades of all the weights. Uh, because you had just swapped these two parameters. The width and the weight were swapped in the, in the, in the space. And what that, but what that left you with was the master was in the middle, and that gray, thicker line shows you all the grades of the master weight. But in order to get all the grades of the other weights, you had to go somewhere else. And the, the variable interface doesn't allow that, really. The variable font has to have everything go through the master. So we uh, did that whole project, but you ended up with this gigantic space of weights and grades, and the user had to actually go find what they wanted, and I just said, forget it. But it was that experiment that led to parametric control of the main elements and organized, organized my mind into how to use the variable font technology. And what it says is that you make these axes that just contain 
uh, the changes to one thing at a time. Um, and if you just change one thing at a time, you can add those changes together because of the way the technology works and create a regular looking typeface family, but the person can go to any place in the design space and get grades. So um, I, 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 I got a call from uh, uh, Google uh, um, right after the announcement and I had started working on this before because there had been a whole nine month inside of the type industry arguing about whether variable fonts should happen and I was fairly quiet about it but uh, at the same time I was designing and I uh, I tried to do this serif typeface uh, uh, back in the 90s called Millennium that I had gotten, I was using variable technology from Apple and I got so confused about what was going on that I just, I just quit and ended up making four typeface families out of that variation font. One of them was Giza, another one was called Millennium that was for the Chicago Tribune and there were two other serif typefaces that I just split out and made normal fonts. This time I didn't want to do that and so I started out with another failure but then this whole thing dawned on me that the reversing of the parameters through this master would give you this, this huge kaleidoscope of styles. Um, and uh, I understood that I was going to have to get very, very good control over the elements, the roots, the six pieces were going to have to be controlled separately. And they were going to have to have just the right parametric changes and just the right panometric range in order to make this work and uh, so then Google called and said you know can you give me some variable fonts because this thing's going to launch in August and I said well I can start on them um, and so uh, they asked me for a font that had 20 axis and uh, I said I don't think you want that um, uh, so uh, we argued for a long time about how best to do this and it ended up br being broken up into two fonts. One of them is a toy, Decovar, and uh, you can l look at that from the links uh, online. I won't go into it too much, but it is literally based on the elements. The elements, it's a modular typeface that doesn't look modular, but uh, it's based on the elements and you can have like an unlimited number of, uh, of uh, uh, variations in it and that was going to be the typeface that was going to satisfy the number of axes that he wanted and then uh, the face you're looking at now is called Amstelvar and this was going to prove a totally different point having just the right number of axes and no more um, but we ended up with more than 20 axes when we were done and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute but um, so uh, typically grade changes the weight, as I've said. And if you look, I, I, I make movies of variable fonts that people can barely see what's going on. Um, but this face has just changed grades uh, while you were sitting here looking at me, um, a, as opposed to the bouncing around the screen type. I make type that you have to really watch carefully. Um, uh, so everything here is also uh, staying the same. The um, first I adjust the grade and then I very slowly adjust the contrast to um, uh, a much higher contrast typeface. You didn't see anything, did you? Okay, now then the next one <laughs> is um, uh, the, uh, 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 as a typographer, I am aware that people have uh, used different line lengths, different column widths, and the longer a line is, the more line spacing the person needs to recover to find the next line. The sh narrower the column width is, the, uh, uh, the less line spacing there could be. But the descenders and ascenders uh, need to move ideally in order to make that happen. 
So um, here you see, uh, if you watch the word type up there, uh, it should move eventually so that the, uh, 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 the descenders get longer. I'm not getting my movies here. Oh, there it goes. All right. So, and then uh, what I do is I change the column width. And um, so now they're too long for the column width. And if you watch carefully, the word type is in the fourth line in the middle. And the descenders are going to go up to where they belong. And this is sort of a valuable thing uh, for people who are doing web programming, where you have, you don't know what the column's going to be. But with this technology, you can set your narrowest column and you make your descenders the way you want for the narrowest column. You can set it for the widest column, make the descenders you want for the widest column, and then CSS will interpolate in between so that every column width is going to have, uh, assuming you're adjusting the line spacing, which, which is what we are doing in addition, you'll get the right uh, stuff in between. And this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about where you give the person tremendous amount of power without actually uh, having them have to use it. So we can give somebody an algorithm that will properly line space and we can give somebody uh, a font with descenders and all they have to do is make the decisions on the ends and everything else works fine, ideally. So uh, that's uh, three elements. There is uh, my roots, my parameters, the fact that it's a panometric system now, but it isn't anything without the user. And uh, most people have never heard about this, but they work with it all the time. The first time I learned about it, I asked Greg Hitchcock at Microsoft why I couldn't adjust the accents uh, in hinting uh, at a certain time in the process. And he said, that's because of the mantra. And uh, I said, the what? <laughs> and I was on the West Coast, so you got to be tolerant to those people out there. Um, but it is the specification of the font. It is uh, uh, an operating systems have to have every answer. And this is the biggest difference between analog type and digital type is that if I'm a typographer in the 1920s, I say the name of the typeface family, and I say the weight, and I don't really have to say anything about it other than that. But when you specify a typeface that you're using today, if you just specify those things, it's only those things that change and all these other defaults remain as they were specified. So, for example, when I told you that the line that you draw in uh, your font uh, program is uh, transparent, um, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the user can't specify it to be uh, two points thick. Um, but the default is that it is zero thick. Um, and the, the computer has to know everything. Um, whether you say it or not, it has this full specification in its tiny little brain. And uh, you have to uh, either accept the defaults or change them. And so uh, 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 I look at it like this. And I usually see red type a little clearer than that, but it's bright. So these are the main things that designers and type designers work with. Uh, the the uh, uh, script, classification, family, style, treatment, effect, character, glyphs. Some of these are familiar to you from menus and applications. And these menus all gather this information together and give it the mantra. Um, Within these, there are sometimes a list, like what family. Now, there's, there are subsections of the spec going into details of the effects and treatments. And I define effects as something that you do to the typeface that I've given you. And a treatment is something that you're going to add to it. So if you're going to add a drop shadow or an underline or something, that is the computer generating something to, to add a treatment to the file. Font. And effect is just like it's the size that you just uh, 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 that you decide to use. 
So it doesn't cover the entire mantra most of the time because when you install your system, you choose the, the nationality uh, that, that you're working in and that uh, sometimes nationalities have multiple uh, languages uh, and you have to choose that too, but by the time you're done, you've specified uh, what every document you're going to create is going to have for a script. Um, um, so that happens when you install the operating system. And in HTML, uh, the first line of just about every HTML document is something like meta character set equals UTF equals 8, which to me doesn't mean anything, but to my computer it means Latin. <laughs> right? Um, so um, at the end of the specification, besides the chart, besides the things that the, the designers and type designers get in, involved in are decisions that are made automatically in applications or by device drivers or in JavaScript or cascading style sheets, making appropriate queries and taking the appropriate steps to output the typography wherever the user aims their publication. So I almost never associate my typeface with a particular resolution, like 16 pixels is not really that important to me, but it's very important to people who use the typeface, and so I have to make some things happen, like hints or something, or regularize the design of the typeface so that if, if somebody wants it to work really well at 16, then that intrudes into the process. But typically, we lay, leave that stuff to software as type designers because the resolution is increasing so, so, so much that we have less and less to worry on that particular thing. Uh, it's not to mention in the fields of both graphic and web design, there can be a lot of specification back and forth. Uh, we don't read text directly across the page. We read like this. It's called a saccade. Uh, uh, and we all, always do. You don't know about it. They didn't even know about it until they started tracking people's eyes. They just assumed that you just read with your eyes straight across the page but it's a much, much more complicated biological process than that. Where, uh, and they're still not quite sure whether you just stop to rest or you stop because there's something, you know, there's an aperture missing or whether there's a word you don't know, uh, you don't understand or a combination of words you don't understand. Um, but uh, the same process goes on in specification. Um, the, the, the graphic designer starts out and they say, well, it's going to be Latin uh, and it's going to be uh, Helvetica. Uh, and then uh, they might say, well, no, I'm sick of Helvetica. Uh, I don't like it as much as Gil Sands or as Helvetica knew, uh, if they're really adventurous. Um, so it goes back and forth and sizes are the same way. And after, even after the graphic designer is done, there's this, in, in a web situation, there's this, this thing that goes on with the sizes where uh, each, each device that a person downloads, downloads it to lands in a separate place in the mantra. Um, uh, so style treatment and effect are really changing with variable fonts because the barriers are broken down. While both modern and old processes allowed for different treatments, like the same metal font and different X and Y bodies, the traditional digital designs, even more treatments to letter spacing and letting were allowed, and variations in the first, is the first time that all six of the root elements I started with in the beginning are going to be available to the user. Uh, it used to be that the nothing in the middle was blocked, you know, uh, even in digital type. If you uh, wanted to change that inside, you were more likely to ruin the typeface by scaling it horizontally uh, only. So, um, and obviously in metal type, you couldn't get to that inside, but you could get to the outside. You could file off the edges of you, and you could do all kinds of stuff to metal type. And in digital type, there's basically a seamless connection between the beginnings and endings of things in the type and the letter spacing and the line, uh, line spacing of type and tracking uh, uh, and uh, the ability of the user to add kerning to the font makes that that part of it uh, fully 
integrated uh, with variations type. And so, so for the first time, the other parts of it are also integrated. Uh, and this includes the nothing in the middle and the heights of things can be changing. Uh, and this is not just for, uh, you know, an animation, uh, although variable fonts has some very interesting uh, possibilities in animation. Um, but otherwise, if you wanted to animate something, you have to go in and do a lot of work to get that stuff to move around. Now with variable fonts, it's going to be considerably easier. And I did some demonstrations of that the, the first round with a font called Zycon with a bicycle mover, a bicycle rider, and a lizard. And you can see those things on, uh, on the web these days with people doing them. And uh, there's also a wonderful person from Australia named uh, Man Mandy Michael who uh, grabs everything that I do and, and makes things with it. And she's done some uh, uh, code, uh, published some stuff on, uh, I don't know what it's called, CodeBot or something like that, where she shows uh, Decovar growing grass, uh, which I didn't really plan on. <laughs> But uh, she's, she, she's, she's really uh, uh, an interesting uh, creative. Um, so that sort of leaves me uh, trying to pull it all together, uh, which typically requires the demonstration of this traditional root-based parametric type and a panametric font through the steps of mantra and script all the way out to rendering, as it might be required for one or more jobs spanning a range of document types. And that's what I'm being asked to do now by, by uh, Google and Microsoft, to uh, prove that my way of, uh, of making type has uh, uh, some benefit to workhorse typefaces uh, in the world. Um, there is a, uh-oh. There is a problem with this uh, um, in that they completely fucked up the format. Um, you see over here where it says wrong, uh, what's wrong about this is that these are the point size masters. And you can see if you have your eyes open and haven't fallen asleep from the beer <laughs> that there are differences. It's pretty obvious. And so I want to record those differences. You can see the X transparency of these two H's is actually the same. I've added most of the weight to the outside because the smaller sizes need to get wider. But then here, it's, it's much narrower. It goes from 804 units to 616. You can see everything else is changing. Uh, all, the, all of my parametric values are changing from one face to another. That is illegal. You can't do that in the format. They all have to be the same, and that doesn't work. So uh, I have all the parametric uh, ingredients in my type to, to define the, uh, um, are you going to run? No. Are you running? Hello? <laughs> Amstelvar? It's on, it's, it's used to being asleep at this time. Uh, I'm just going to leave. I can't touch it. Yes. Did something happen? Oh, well, anyways. So what you're seeing forming here is one parametric axis at a time. I am changing the X height. I'm going to try it again. OK. So I'm changing the X transparency to make a smaller size. And then I'm changing the weight a little bit to make it heavier, as you saw in the H going on. And then I'm changing the X height. And then I'm changing the ascenders. Okay, and these are happening one thing at a time, but they equal optical size minimum. And then for the optical size maximum, everything goes in the opposite direction. I'm making it narrower, I'm making it lighter, 
I'm giving it more contrast, and I'm shrinking the excite, and I'm not changing the ascender because I want it to be more efficient. The thing that people don't understand about optical sizes, I spent two days at Microsoft explaining this, is that they don't just go down for benefit. Uh, what most people know is that a smaller optical size has changed the way I do it for easier reading, but the larger size is for more information to be available, more space for information. So optical size has a benefit going up in that you can get more information in less space. Going down, you get more legibility, but it takes more space. So then when you... Uh, these things are blended together to form uh, I'm now magically moving the weight axis and these are blended together so I can get to a light and I can get to a black and notice that I'm still at 12 point so this is a 12 point super extra wide okay And then here, I've blended the X transparency and I've changed the weight and I've changed the contrast a little bit to make the, uh, the width axis happen. Again, you see that this is, these are all 12 point masters. That if this may look like it's awkward and lots of space in it, but if you see this at 12 point, it's very clear. And then I repeat the second slide that I did before, um, taking it, showing you the width, axis, and ax action, and ending out at the widest width. Twelve points still, and then down below, I go to about the same space. I wanted to try to keep it on the same line in the second example so I don't go to exactly the same space but you'll get the idea and so this is the 12 point um, and now I'm going to go across the optical size axis and you see that I've combined everything I didn't have to draw any of this stuff it just happens because I'm careful, I understand the elements I'm working with, I'm looking at the param parametric values very carefully, and once you blend all this stuff together, you have this gigantic space of design that I have no idea how to price. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll come up with something so this is what I want to happen, which is that when you change the optical size, these parametric axes show you where they're going. Okay? And the reason for that is so A, the user can make little tiny changes if they want to, or B, you can program something to look better on a retina or to have its, its uh, you guys want to see that one again? or to have it, uh, see I can do it, this is great, I like this. Normally you have to do this with your hands and move stuff around and it, just having my robot here with me is so much fun. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you can turn this typeface over to a specification for a whole bunch of viewports uh, and devices that it's being output on and you can say, you can just pinpoint what's going to have to happen in those devices and write it in CSS. Uh, just change the type in CSS. So the object of the game is to create a user interface where the type designer gets to... Uh, the, uh, the type designer makes something like this for a workhorse typeface and then the user gets basically three axes. Width, weight, and optical size. Optical size should operate automatically. Weight and width are things that are sometimes chosen um, uh, uh, you know, by visual inspection, which is, uh, which is what I call fishing, and sometimes they're done by figuring. Um, so for example, in a, uh, oh, and sometimes both, 
Um, so uh, you may decide that you are going to uh, go to a, a narrower column and you're not just going to make some changes, but you can actually make the type narrower. There are some people who are using the width axis now to completely squish the type when it goes onto the phone and then let it loose on the desktop. And there are various different ways that people can, can harness this technology to use it. But in the end, what I'm trying to do is make it so that things that are familiar to them are a small number of sliders. And then the things that are more familiar to the production or to the details of the design working in a various place are available for programming. Um, and so that, uh, that gives everybody some sort of a, uh, or it gives a lot of different parts of an organization a way into variable fonts that is, can be very valuable for them. If they're publishing a magazine with different printing uh, technologies being used, and it's also going to the web, then you could have people using all of these axes for different things in a workhorse typeface. This is not to say that there aren't a lot of axes that are just plain fun. Um, because that is going to be the majority, I think, of what variations are, is people coming up with ways to animate things and, and do interesting visual things that are not necessarily associated uh, with the very fine points of reading, which is, is pretty much what I understand. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
in a lot of places. Uh, and I'm not just doing this for France, you know. Uh, it's for everybody who uses Dito. Uh, uh, and there are other typefaces like that. There are, there are a lot of cases where the sans serif is just sort of crowding all the other styles out. And when people say they hate it, well, do something about it. And that's what I'm thinking. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of, 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 you know, making it so that organizations are not so afraid to choose a serif typeface at all. I mean, uh, there are these four application, uh, there are these four companies that are working on this technology, and they all have sans serif, boring sans serif faces for their corporate ID. Do you know why? They're scared of using something else. And so I've gone to, from one to another challenging them, find a serif face to use for your corporate ID and match it with this sans serif. And I'm about to throw down the gauntlet, how do you say that in French? Throw down the gauntlet to challenge them to add a serif typeface to their corporate IDs. That's next week though. <laughs> Did I answer any of your questions? Yes. Uh, but go ahead. Then. Yeah, uh, about, about the uh, document design, because it's different from graphic design. So it means that people uh, who want to, uh, to involve themselves with worker, <coughs> ty uh, worker typefaces want to design uh, books and a very long, uh, long text for, for knowledge and all. It's, it's a different use that just display typefaces. So it means that a new uh, kind of designer will be uh, using uh, uh, variable fonts such yes, as yours. Yes, and that person will be called a typographer again. Yeah. You know, because the typographer didn't choose the fonts. The art director did in the old days. The art director chose the font and the typographer figures out how to make that work. So that's what I'm looking at. I mean, type designers have become the only typographers left because we have to test our fonts and all these other ways. So um, I think that we need to get more typographers out there and I think variation fonts is a great way to do it because it makes, it, it makes some things really easy like I use optical sizes. Well that happens, that's going to happen automatically but the typographer is going to make sure that those optical sizes are being used. What, the way we do it now is that uh, we give people a bunch of optical size masters and then we give them a script that makes sure that the ranges that those sizes are being used is incorrect. It doesn't make it so that they're going to use the right ones though. But uh, we need to have more typographers. The people who are doing the figuring as opposed to the people who are doing the fishing. So, you know, the typographer used to say uh, how long is the text. He would take those number of words and calculate that into you have to use six point if you're going to fit in this book size. And that does, the, you know, that was that was taken over by the Macintosh, and uh, one of the sponsors' software, and uh, that sponsor's software just scaled the same thing up and down, and that was very, very damaging to a, a lot of kinds of users. A lot of the people who were typographers back then left, right? And then, you know, with with Font Bureau and uh, the development of custom fonts and the opening of Type One at the very generous uh, offer of one of the sponsors, uh, we were able to get into making type one fonts um, partly by threatening with true type. Uh, we, got, we got the type one format open and that made it so that we could start to help fix this and start getting typographers back into magazines and newspapers that we were working with. And the art directors usually are too busy for that stuff. They just want to know that their type choices are going to be implementable in the document design that they want to do without them having to do that much work. And so we've done some of that and now we're trying to automate the parts of the process that should be automated, like which size do you choose and which style do you use if you're going to gravure. Those things people shouldn't have to figure out all the time. They make a couple of measurements and choose the right font or uh, call us on the phone and we can help them. And all we have to do now is say, oh no, that's not 432, it's 436. We don't have to go make a custom font anymore. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. He looks big and he's sitting down. <laughs> 
more question hi hi um, I was just wondering one thing okay you, sh you showed uh, this the thing about uh, the ascenders and the descenders oui. with the column width yeah so when the column goes narrower you can get the ascenders shorter so oui. it's sort of nicer right now art directors or designers can already get lost with fonts in the, the way they use them are you not sort of somehow worried that with variable fonts designers and art directors go get lost terrified get on with it <laughs> <laughs> no really how, how no I, I I feel the fear uh, I mean you see 12 sliders in my fonts but I don't plan on that you know I plan on people having a couple of the same sliders the same options that they had before at the beginning of the mantra and more options at the end of the mantra okay but it's going to take a little bit of back and forth uh, to figure out uh, who does what. I mean, uh, we're not trying to change uh, the world. We're trying to uh, bring something that was there before uh, in a new form. And um, this entire lecture, I've only talked about Latin. Uh, <coughs> there are scripts that don't do very well at all without this stuff. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese, uh, they desperately need optical sizes for, uh, because what they're doing is they're changing weights. I mean, a lot of people have been doing this today. All of the, all of the material, I mean, we, we gathered all the material design, uh, the corporate ID work from several of uh, uh, the people who are involved in the variation alignment to do an analysis for them on how much better and easier their type would be to use and we're still working on that um, trying to figure out the balance uh, between complexity and quality you know and that balance is not one thing for every you know you know playboy was very 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 picky about how their text face was going to look um, uh, the you know the corner bakery shop has other notions you know uh, um, so I am greatly concerned about uh, the complexity of this uh, changing things but um, you uh, and I didn't make anybody do this by the way I mean <laughs> this wasn't my idea uh, I'm just trying to help um, so there there there's a lot there's a there's a long road uh, well relatively modern terms it's going to take three or four years for the technology check you can see the the the, uh, the 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 problem that I showed with the way the parametric axis don't connect if that doesn't happen if I can't get that connect it's a real disaster because the user is using width and weight and those other axes aren't reacting and they can easily I mean you can make Amstelvar you know 90 percent of the styles in Amstelvar are, are incredibly ugly because it's it's amazingly easy to screw things up um, so I'm, I'm very, very conscious of that. I'm not just, you know, trying to give people toys. Uh, I'm trying to give people things that will work very well. Most of the toy variable fonts I see are totally safe. You know, they give people the ability to go doing, 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 and, and, and everything works fine. Uh, uh, but they, it's all fishing. They're all looking for something that they want it to look like. Um, as opposed to the typefaces like Amstelvara where I'm, I'm trying to harness these underlying colors that exist. You know, it's like you've all been given orange, purple, and uh, what's the other one, green, right? And nobody knows that there's red, yellow, and blue, but they're there, trust me. <laughs> Did I help? Yes. Okay. And the other thing, I, I want to mention this because it's really important. This is 100% backward compatible and none of your old fonts break. Okay, so everything works like it did before if you don't want to do this, right? And a variable font 
in a non-variable environment will work like regular fonts because it has these instances inside of it. It may be a big menu. If you go to your Adobe apps now and look at the experimental variation fonts you're, gi you're given, they have you know, like 300 instances in there. I'm trying to avoid that. Uh, I guess my question was kind of the continu continuation of this. Uh, it's about, uh, oh. it's about, yeah, I'm here. I'm right next to, that's why it's the continuation of the same question. <laughs> that is going to be him. Uh, so I was just thinking about licensing. Do you think that you were saying that you have this whole massive system that you don't know how to price? Do you believe that licensing, which is really complicated now, uh, do you believe it can be simplified with complexifying the, you know, font systems behind? Because now you have like four weights and 1,000 licensing options. So what are you going to, well, you're going to get one font with their variable well, fonts. 1,000 weights and one licensing option. Is that better? <laughs> well, well, it's a complicated topic. But let me, let me start by saying that uh, it's going to be a long time before, uh, well, let me start out by saying something even more primitive than that. The, the, the use of variable fonts in print uh, is exactly the same as it was. Um, the instance that you choose to use is turned into a regular font and sent to the, to, sent to the device, okay? So the big thing about variable fonts is in a web world, uh, the entire variable font is sitting on a server and the entire variable font is sent to the user, and whichever styles the designer has picked are there and are used. Okay? So for the user themselves, they don't ever know what's going on. And this is going to happen with all the OS fonts. All the operating system fonts are going to be like this because they're getting so big. They're being covered. They're covering all these scripts, and they're getting larger and larger and larger, and having a a family of four weights of kanji uh, is too big for the web. So uh, the web is having a difficult reaction in certain cultures because of the inability for the scripts to be represented properly. And people are just using the defaults. They're only using the defaults in some scripts because you can't download anything. There's no downloadable fonts in Japanese. Right? So. I think that that's a, an inhibition of culture if they can't choose weights and, and, and do things uh, more freely uh, the way we do. Um, so there's that whole uh, world script issue. And the object there is to get all the world scripts operating with the same capabilities. Uh, but that's separate sort of from the, the, the question you have. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm interested in how people react to this uh, because uh, there are these two aspects. There's the creative aspect of it, and there's the productive aspect of it, and then there's the transform, uh, the transformation it brings to to world scripts, and it's the the performance, but it's the performance benefit that got all these companies to adopt it, right? So uh, the performance benefit is that if you're using more than three styles on a website, the variable font is going to download quicker. And if you're uh, a company like Google and you uh, uh, can get um, people to download a variable font that's used for lots of different companies, then you're making it so that those, the users can see the content quicker. And these are the kinds of people where when you say, well, how much quicker, they say, on an average, one one millionth of a second. And you go, yeah. And it's a big deal to them because a one millionth of a second to them when they're serving a billion fonts a second, it's, it's like lots of time and space and money for those people. So that's what originally got them to, uh, uh, to adopt it. And as soon as they did so, I said, you've just let a Trojan horse in. You understand what you're really doing. And they said, nah, it's just a Trojan goat. And I said, no, it's a Trojan horse. And so now they're starting to figure out that there's a very significant 
like it's it's like a hall of you know Versailles. They thought they were opening one window, and the type designers are opening hundreds of windows, and all these ideas are screaming in, and you know the authors of the spec are starting to go on long vacations. So it's going to be a while before all this stuff shakes out, but in the meantime, um, how long? A prediction? Uh, May of 2020. I'm always right. <laughs> More uh, question? Uh, what kind of uh, notable changes have you noticed um, while in your process while designing Amstelvar versus um, the other typefaces that That's you That's a great question. I haven't told anybody this, so don't tell anybody. But making fonts the way I used to make them was just like you had all this, you're going to make a shirt. And somebody gave you the fabric and the scissors, and you had to make it without ever turning it inside out. Well, you know that's really hard to do. If you imagine, I mean, take that shirt off, turn it inside out, and you see where all the seams are. Right? So that's what I'm thinking. That's the way I'm working. I'm seeing things from the inside out. I'm seeing how, you know, with these, these parametric axes, I'm divide, you know, I didn't used to divide things up into parts and parameters. I just drew and did and, you know, you know all the way through um, uh, most of my career I did that. It, it wasn't until about six or seven years ago that I started saying, okay, I got to start getting a handle on this because it's going to happen. And then three years ago, I got a handle on it. And so it's really helped me to understand that there are these colors, sort of, that you don't think about, uh, that I was, I knew that they were there because I was working on them. I knew that there was red, green, and blue in type. Um, uh, but I didn't really know how I was going to harness that until I started working inside out and all the way around the design space. And it really helped me um, to, uh, in the Amstelar project, it was a whole set of uh, a learning how to harness what I knew into design space. And in Decovar, it was a whole new way of understanding how to uh, make changes and blend them for the user in advance and separate them for other users and, and make the right things for fishing versus the right things for figuring. Uh, so that's, that's how it helped me a lot. Um, I'm going to have to design, I, I've, I've now been working on about 15 variable fonts in the last two years so that I get a more rounded approach. Uh, the first, the modular agency typeface that I showed before, I've seen a thousand uh, uh, customizations of it in graphic design studios so for Mission Impossible. Every disaster movie uses this font and they, they make it into a new disaster. Right? So uh, being able to harness some of the simpler disasters for them and giving them, you know, watching how people use things and then giving them the ability to go character, make these, this, these, descend these ends of things happen here and this ends of things happen there, next character, and, you know, giving somebody that capability is, is, you know, a really interesting way to present the kinds of variations that are in display faces. So it, it's helping me both in my design work and in seeing how I want to develop applications with people to keep the complexity away from this kind of user and add complexity for that kind of user. And that's, you know, that's something that really uh, we haven't had a lot of experience with because the fonts were so dumb that you just had to look at the name or a thousand names and figuring out what they were. So. Uh, I think that the benefits are great, uh, both for the uh, user community and for the type design community to get a better handle on what they're doing. Now, there's a great rejectionist uh, movement in type design that says, we don't want to do this, we don't want to know about it, uh, we just want to work the way we were doing before. And I completely respect that, you know, because um, uh, th everybody has their own theories on how this works. But I can tell you that every major foundry that I know of is working their little fingers to the bone 
trying to figure out what I'm doing and what they're going to do about it. And uh, I'm in a very open and sharing environment. So the things that I've just said to you, I'm planning on saying to the type community in a couple of months uh, to try to calm them down a little bit. And if that doesn't work, I always have a fire extinguisher. We? I'm, I'm not a type designer, I'm a graphic designer. That's okay. <laughs> but I was, my, my question is, is this like the revolution between uh, vinyl and... So you Wait, I didn't understand. I didn't understand, you're a graphic designer. Can you ask yeah. the question again? No, is it, I'm just like a user and I, I was like thinking, is this like a revolution like from vinyl to CD? So that... Uh, we. Oui. Well, it's, it's more like the studio kept all the instruments separate. Yeah. You know, the way that digital music works now, they take all these various tracks and they blend them and you get volume. You can play with the equalizer to deal with ranges of the sound, but what I'm talking about now is that you have George over there, John over there, Ringo over there, and you can turn Ringo off if you don't want him. You don't like Ringo either? <laughs> Isn't he like the last one who's alive? Okay. Well, anyways. So every phone family we have mm. one phone It will still be one file. One file, yeah. And that alone is a great savings for some people who, I mean, it, yeah, yeah. That, that part of it is really important to a lot of people. If you want to, like, if you want to, uh, uh, like, for example, I had to load 30 fonts onto my iPad to make it so that I could do my keynote presentation, where I could have just added three. And so just gathering up the fonts you have can be a lot easier. And, and transporting things in general is a lot easier. Did that answer? A question? Every time the microphone passes, I get more water. Yeah, you should. Uh, That's the deal. It seems that uh, optical size is a very clever and a very useful variation. Clever because it, uh, it matches with everything. And now what, what kind of variations you could uh, or expect Merci. or you desire? You have new kind of variations in your mind that would oh. be very interesting for the future or the, the next days and the next years. And he, that's well, it. Most of the variation axes I work on are for a need. Yeah. So as new needs arrive, for example, um, there are people who are predicting we'll all be working white type on black screens to make our batteries last longer. You understand this, that uh, I think it, 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 the batteries last longer for people who use white type on a back, black background. So it could be that I design a whole family that's based on that. And the changes that I make it, I, I make the default is that it works in black and white and I make changes to work white and black. So that's a very, very simple example of as time goes by and things change. But the biggest thing that I'm looking for as time goes by is that we're getting a larger and larger world population of multi-script users. Right? I mean, it's skyrocketing. The number of people who have uh, parents from two different sides of the world who speak languages at two different sides of the world. We're, 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 we're getting to like a billion people who, who speak Chinese and something else. Um, and so that, that is a new thing, that, that the volume of those people who are doing that uh, is a new thing. 
And so having, uh, having everything being Latinized does not really work anymore. And having everything Latinized is how it's been forever. I mean, to the Helveticanus of the world is Latinization. There are some scripts, as I said, that don't really like that at all. So uh, preventing any further erosion of typographical culture is like an advanced thing we're doing, but figuring out exactly how you do that, how you make it so that the Latin reacts to the Chinese uh, is something that I've studied for quite a while, so I already know how to do that, but how the Latin uh, reacts to Arabic, where the Arabic is the king and the Latin reacts to it, there's a lot of questions, as well as with Armenian, Hebrew, and all the Caucasian languages. And uh, Cyrillic and Latin don't always get together in every design, and somebody has to be the default. So I'm trying to end that situation with this technology, where there is no default. The default is neutrality, and when the user chooses their script, the font that they start using is defaulted to their script. Okay, so that's a real. There's a real simple thing: white on black versus black on white. And there's a really complicated thing out there, which is making everybody feel at home with their own script, as opposed to it changing to work better with Latin. Right, and then there are other things that I can imagine, but I don't know what I'm going to do with yet. Or uh, um, there are a lot of other people out there who, who want type to animate much more easily um, and be s still the same size as a font. You know, If you take a font that does animations and you give it all the instructions, the font doesn't get any bigger. The movie becomes a font with a few instructions that make it so it can run. So that's a whole new application of fonts that I'm sure that people will be exploring a lot because um, the first thing that people notice about variable fonts, even if you're not trying to do animation, it's the animation that gets them. I mean, you can see what happened here on the screen when it started to animate, but these fonts are not made for animation, right? I only animate them so you can see. Um, but I think animation of fonts is a huge thing. Color in fonts is also a, a huge thing that has a, 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 a big future. And um, inventing scripts has a new kinds of feature. And inventing hybrids between scripts has a new feature. So there's all this, there's all this stuff brewing around. And um, it's, again, it's very important to remember that it's not going to change the way things are unless you want it to. So no one's going to force anybody to use uh, you know, variation fonts, except Google. I mean, no, no. Uh, you, you will be using variation fonts from Google, Microsoft, and Apple in the next year and a half, and you won't know. You won't have to do anything about it. You don't have to know about it. It's just going to make things work faster for you. And if you're lucky, if we're all lucky, they use them better. Pizza time? No, our, our drive, it's, it's full. Oh, they're going to make me answer more questions for a pizza? Thank you very much, David. Oh, they're not. <laughs> See you next year. À peine 14 ans après sa création, l'iconique école de design du Bohos fut fermée par le régime nazi. De nombreux trésors et chefs-d'œuvre inachevés y furent abandonnés, cachés aux yeux du monde. Reposant sur l'idée de former une nouvelle génération d'artistes pour créer un monde meilleur, le Bohos a jeté les bases du design moderne tel que nous le connaissons aujourd'hui changeant à jamais la créativité. Dans l'Allemagne des années 1930, toutefois, les idées progressistes du Bohos étaient considérées comme une menace, rendant inéluctable la fermeture de l'école. Mais parfois, ce qui a été oublié avec le temps peut renaître à tout moment.
l'influence de Boos est toujours aussi puissante. À partir de maintenant, vous pouvez créer avec un morceau d'histoire.